Thanks so much, everybody, for making it in today, online or in person. So officially welcome. Bonjour tout le monde. Welcome to Concordia University's Force Space. Thanks so much for joining us for this info session about graduate studies in film and moving image studies here at Concordia University. We are joined today by two profs and three graduate students from that program eager to speak to you about the program itself and their own research projects. Just to help situate you, we are streaming to YouTube live from Fourth Space, which is located on unceded indigenous lands here in Jogjage, Montreal. And we'd like to extend our gratitude to the Kanyankahaga Nation, who are the caretakers for the lands and waters we are meeting on, for their teachings about the earth and our relations. At Fourth Space, if it's your first time in here in person or, or virtually, please make yourselves comfortable. You're welcome to move your chair around uh, to, to best see the screen or the folks in the space as you wish. What we do here is work with our university community to mobilize and exchange knowledge by co-creating daily activities such as this one. So it's really our pleasure to have collaborated with the profs and students from Film and Moving Image Studies program here today to make this conversation possible. I'll just also mention there will be time for a QA. and a And uh, if you're in the space, just raise a hand. We'll get a mic to you so that the folks on Zoom can hear you. And if you're on Zoom, you're more than welcome to turn on your camera and speak to us directly. Otherwise, the chat is activated. On that note, it's my pleasure to pass it over to you, Luca. Welcome. All right. Thank you, Anna. Thank you all for coming uh, or for connecting. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be in fourth space. Um, and now I think I should play some records, right? Is that, that how it works? I spin some records and uh, and that's the end of the presentation. Um, thank you for coming. So we're called, first of all, our name. It used to be called Film Studies and now it's called Film and Moving Image Studies, which gives you an idea of what's been happening in our discipline in the past 10, 20 years. That is to say, um, we used to be just a bunch of people going to the movies inside a theater, and now movies have taken over our life and they are in every single platform that we own. So as a department and as a discipline, we have been following uh, what has been happening in the world out there. So we have decided to change the name of our program to film and moving image studies. Um, my name is Luca Caminati. I'm the director of the Film Studies program. I'm also the director of the Film and Moving Image Studies program and the director of the MA program. Um, so I'll be happy to answer all your questions um, after. Before, before we get to your questions, I thought that it would be a good idea to hear um, from uh, uh, some of our students and from my colleague uh, Ishita Chiwari. So we are go we all going to sort of introduce ourselves as we move along. Um, we have prepared a, a bunch of slides for you. Um, and I ask uh, um, my colleague uh, and the students to send us one slide or two slides that are representative of their work and of their current research. Um, we want you to do, to do this so that you have an idea of what is going on uh, in the graduate program of uh, the Film and Moving Image the studies um, in film and moving image studies. And let's see, I think we, oh, we got it. Yes. All right, I think we're ready for the slides, right? Yes, I'm getting a big thumb up. There you go, that's us. As you know, we are inside the Mel Hoppenheim School of Cinema, which has three branches, animation, um, production and, and us. Um, the MA, so the, the MA in, uh, yeah, you can go to number two, the MA in Film and Movie Religious Studies um, is been going on since the mid 80s. Um, we <clears throat> receive about 50 to 60, sometimes 70 application per, per round. Our deadline is February 1st, it just ended. <clears throat> and we usually have set between 10, <clears throat> sorry, 10 to 15 students. So it's competitive, but it's not impossible. And uh, we have students from literally all over the world, from uh, from downtown Montreal to the farthest regions of the of the planet. It has become now a, a world renowned program. Um, and uh, so we, we receive up and we are going through applications right now. And as always, the application are really from from uh, um, everywhere. If you want to go to the next slide. You, yeah, so the, the PhD uh, in film and moving image studies is relatively newer. It was started in 2001. 
Um, but we are already producing PhD students who go out into the world and get jobs in other university and um, we are starting to get students of our students, which is always great. It means that we are um, sending out people into the world out there and um, and sending students back back to us. The PhD is way more competitive. We receive uh, between 50 and 80 applications every year, but we only accept five to six students. So the, the PhD student is uh, highly competitive um, and very much sought after um, uh, program. Um, the, um, I don't know what's the next slide actually. Oh, okay. Well, um, so why don't I, rather than ha listening to me, oh, I usually spit out numbers <laughs> because I've been an administrator for too long. I thought that it would be a good idea to listen to some of our students. So uh, Claire, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us uh, what you were doing before and what are you working on right now? Hi everyone, um, welcome to this open day. Um, my name is Claire Begbie. I'm a second year PhD student in the Film and Moving Image Studies um, program. And uh, I have a background actually in quite a different field. Um, I have a background in language and area studies, um, specifically Arabic and Middle East studies. And before coming here, I lived in Egypt, in Cairo for five years, where I did my master's. And in the course of that master's, I kind of gravitated towards the film department and kind of the field of cinema because that really felt to me like it brings all my interests in cultural, like cultural history, um, language, politics, aesthetics, kind of brings those interests together. Um, and I actually wrote my thesis there on the representation of Palestine in Egyptian cinema. And then in the course of doing that research, I really felt like I wanted to extend, um, extend that research. And now I'm here in my second year and I'm focusing a bit more broadly now on Arab cinema, and but I'm still kind of interested in how the Palestinian subject um, figures in different Arab cinemas um, across the 20th century. But I've started to focus more specifically on the 1970s, which is a time at which a lot of Arab filmmakers were making cinema about the Palestinian struggle. And I'm kind of interested in thinking about these interconnections. You know, a lot of these um, Arab filmmakers are themselves sort of out of place, you know, on the move, kind of exilic filmmakers, oftentimes um, have been to the socialist bloc. So there's a kind of connection um, in the 1970s between, you know, a lot of support was coming from the socialist bloc for the Arab world. And so I'm looking, for example, here, these are two um, images from a filmmaker called Kaisal Zubedi, who's Iraqi, and he dedicated much of his cinematic career to making films about Palestine. And I sort of take these two films and his trajectory as an entry point to looking at a range of Arab cinematic trajectories in connection to the Palestinian struggle. Um, and I guess my framework that I'm sort of my methodology is kind of increasingly becoming transnational cinema studies because that allows me to think um, across between languages, places, and it's very much sort of a positionality I myself um, identify a bit with being bilingual, binational, and always sort of finding myself thinking across and between places. Um, and yeah, this place is ideal for pursuing that kind of study. I'm working with uh, Dr. Masha Salaskina, who has an interest precisely in these kind of transnational socialist world networks um, and cinematic trajectories. And um, yeah, she's very supportive of, of this kind of research that I'm doing. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to talk more about, you know, specifics of the program. I'm really in the early stages, which means I'm still kind of, I'm doing my comps reading, comprehensive exam readings at the moment, which involves selecting different subfields that you want to focus on and doing readings for each of these subfields. And then you take an exam at the end and you're supposed to kind of acquire a basic understanding of these different fields. And for me, that means, you know, transnational cinema, um, translation studies, which interests me as a kind of conceptual way of thinking between and across places and languages. Um, what else? Yeah, intellectual Arab history interests me a lot just to understand the broader historical and theoretical kind of background of my films. So yeah. Perfect. Thank you. On to Jake. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. I think it's Jake. Let's see. Okay. Next slide. No, it no it's no. Jake, right? That would be me, yes. <laughs> of course, yes. So my name is Nikolaos Vasilakos. Uh, pronouns are he, him, his. And I am a first year student in the MA program here in Concordia. 
I, uh, in my background, I've done my uh, undergrad here at Concordia as well in film studies. And um, the idea to go into the AMA program was a last minute decision, but it's honestly one of the best decisions I've taken, honestly. I'm really enjoying it so far. And um, so I intend he, to- He has no choice, but- yeah. I have no choice indeed. <laughs> So um, in terms of my research, I mean, it's still in the planning stages, but uh, I, it was a plan that I've been thinking of uh, since my undergrad. And so what I intend on doing is to explore uh, the national cinema of Greece, specifically in terms of queer coding and um, LGBTQ plus representation and its erasure within the post-war national cinema of Greece. Um, the reason why I wanted to do that is because I wanted to get closer to my roots as a, as a Greek filmmaker and um, Growing up, I had never had the opportunity to really watch Greek movies or be exposed to Greek culture through through its filmography. And so that is what I intend on doing is to explore uh, the different facets, especially in the post-war era, which is considered as the golden age of Greek cinema between the 1950s and the 1960s. That is where uh, most uh, where most of the prolific filmmakers like Mako Kakoyanis uh, with Zorba the Greek and Stella, for instance, made one of the greatest movies of all time in Greece. And um, the reason why I want to approach in terms of LGBTQ representation in this case is because um, homosexuality is a very taboo subject still in Greece today to talk about. Um, but today with filmmakers like uh, Yorgos Lanthimos and uh, Athena Rachel Tsangari, who are part of uh, this movement called the Greek Weird Wave. They try to destigmatize the representation of homosexuality and all those taboo subjects within Greek society. But in the 1950s, it was still um, it was still a taboo subject and we couldn't really see any forms of LGBTQ plus representation. They were there, but in forms of stereotypes. And so what I intend to do is that I want to break down through a selection of movies, uh, the reason why um, from a social cultural perspective, these um, representations, both women, uh, both men, women, and um, the sexual and gender diversities are being omitted within their screens. So if you could just um, go to the next slide. So those are the movies that I've selected for my research, as you can see here. So uh, they're mostly movies from the 60s before the 70s, because in the 70s, there was like a spark of revolution where uh, sexual and gender diversity was prominent in terms of the themes that were being represented. But in the movies that, are, that I'm going to attempt to decode and analyze, it was hard. And in this case, with Michael Kakonyanis, they use queer coding in this case. And by queer coding is... Um, they made allusions to um, sexual and gender diversity within their characters, but it wasn't explicit in this case, it was more implicit. And so what I intend to do with this is to understand, like I mentioned previously, from a social cultural perspective, the reason why uh, filmmakers were prevented from being represented on those screens. And um, interesting thing to note is that in 1951, homosexuality was decriminalized in Greece, but it, there was still some stigma in terms of trying to perfectly represent those uh, uh, those bodies in, on screen. Yeah, thank you, Nick. That was wonderful. wonderful thank you. Presentation. Thank you. So um, from sort of non-Western non cinema, as it used to be called, um, I think the next slide is, uh, is Jake. Um, It's, yeah, I think it's Jake. So, um, Jake, if you want to introduce yourself, tell us where you are quote unquote coming from and what are you doing? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Jake Petrie. I guess I'm the elder graduate student here. I'm a fourth year PhD student uh, in film and moving image studies. Um, probably I can best speak to from from this selection here, the kind of like interdisciplinary, um, like how welcoming this program is to interdisciplinary work. Um, because so I, I come from a more, you know, traditional film studies background um, at Carleton in Ottawa, but I really wanted to research uh, technology, social media, digital media, a lot of these questions about how that changes our interaction with images. Um, and so there were uh, a lot of people in this department that brought me here, um, like Mark Steinberg, Joshua Neves, 
people like that who are doing work that kind of bridges these two worlds sort of as I wanted to do. Um, and so, you know, I, I hate talking about my own work, but I look at how a lot of different tech companies kind of create the narrative of the future and we're kind of all expected to fall in line with what the narrative of the future that they give us is. Um, and so I just kind of try to understand those rhetorics, those narratives and those stories. So, but, you know, so we can fight back against them kind of thing. Um, and so part of that, you know, I worked with Mark Steinberg to start the platform lab. I think we're going to talk more about the labs later. Um, but it's just, you know, a, another example of like having the opportunity to create a research group, have a space where like minded people um, in the program and also outside the program to, can work on kind of similar stuff. Um, and it's all like very well supported here um, where I can still like do the traditional film stuff. I can teach traditional film stuff, um, but I can also do this kind of more in interdisciplinary um, approach to the stuff that I'm into. So. Do you have another slice? No. Do you have another slide? No? Okay. Yeah. So I don't understand what you're doing. What's your work? Tell me. <laughs> Fair enough. So um, I look at, uh, for example, companies like Disney, TikTok, and Twitch um, as kind of examples of companies that are um, trying to design what the future should look like for the rest of us. So um, how we interact with their platforms, how they kind of talk about what the future is going to look like according to their image. Um, and so I kind of dig through um, all their kind of rhetoric and media marketing, all that kind of stuff to come to an understanding of what that future is going to look like um, so that we can recognize it when we see it and also have ways to kind of respond to it. Um, and part of that is also, you know, the kind of images and the kind of interaction with screens that we have in our day to day life and how they kind of control that as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Does that help? Yes, thank <laughs> you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically what happened is that we realized that uh, at first we thought cinema was dead and then we realized that in fact it won big time and now we, lo we all live in a world of diffused images and so we have become a film and media program uh, and the colleagues that uh, Jake just mentioned are precisely colleagues who are now working on new technologies, uh, new uh, system of, of, uh, of uh, appreciation, enjoyment and control um, of, our, of our daily life. I still am not able to uh, have Siri to work. So Jake, your next <laughs> job will be to have Siri to respond to me. As we can talk part, after, yeah. We, as part of this, um, <laughs> A part of this, um, Ishita Tiwari is a Can Canada Research Chair in our program. So Ishita uh, is going to talk. She's going to talk about our labs. I think, right? Yeah. Go for it. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for coming on a Saturday. Uh, I really appreciate it to those who made the time right now, but also those who are online. I know how difficult it can be. I was seriously not expecting so many people to come, so I'm really grateful to come and listen to us. So I want to talk about the research labs. As you can see from our student presentations, we have a really vibrant research culture. And as Luca and all our students have also kind of flagged in their like remarks that it's also really diffused. We look at diffused images. So the, I'll just kind of quickly go over the research labs to talk about the breadth and scope of our department research interests. And uh, so you get a sense of how, how, uh, that, how that we take our research really seriously, but it's also a way to support our students the, in, in terms of the work that they do, but also financially supporting them on this journey. So I'm happy to take questions about this um, after like our the panel. Um, and you know, Jake works at the platform lab, Claire works with me on my lab. Um, and um, so I'll just go over it. Um, so the first lab is the Global Emergent Media Lab. It's run by my colleague, Dr. Joshua Nevis. He's also Canada Research Chair. So the Global Emergent Media Lab, um, essentially, as the name suggests, looks at global media. And it's kind of like rubrics is um, divided into three. So it, had, it has a seminar in media and political theory. It has a works in progress workshop where students, practitioners come in, like, you know, come and present their upcoming work, people give feedback. They also have a screening series called Cinema at the Midst of Struggle. So like nonfiction filmmakers, fiction filmmakers who work on like, say, anything that addresses political issues, ongoing political issues, they're kind of invited, we have a screening, we have a dialogue with them. And it's kind of organized around themes every year. So some of the themes that they've had is like infrastructure, critical race studies, convenience and inconvenience. This year it's on video, art and TV. 
Um, so primarily the output is kind of um, academic. Um, and they also are starting like an open access publishing workshop on work in come spinning from the work in progress series, which is published online and you can see people's work. Um, the second is the platform lab. It's run by my colleague, Dr. Mark Steinberg. So it looks at multifaceted platforms. So like SVO streaming video platforms like Netflix, social media platforms like Twitter, you know, apps like uh, uh, super apps like WeChat. Um, and it also looks at like platforms beyond the global north. So how are platforms performing globally? Um, what's the uneven like economic implications of these platforms or so social, cultural, political, economic um, implications of platform studies? It's global in approach. And again, one of the kind of the things that they do is inviting say researchers for giving talks, having workshops. They also produce end of the year kind of paper, paper reports. So one was on like anime and platforms. Now they're working, I think, on um, convenience. Um, so that's kind of what the platform lab is doing. I run the research lab called Ra. It's a lab on media and migration. It comes from the Farsi word roots. Um, and like the name was chosen because I'm an immigrant running a lab on media and migration. And I felt like a foreign word made sense, but also roots is kind of in Farsi um, connotative of like, also has like these um, pathos attached to it. And so when you're thinking about migration, it's also about the roots people take, but also the roots as scholars we are taking to think about migration. Um, this lab um, really works on a collaborative model. We actually partner with community organizations in Montreal to create public facing research projects. So for instance, we are working with this community organization called Brick by Brick for which Claire is running as a coordinator for that. Brick by Brick is an organization in Park X and it looks at gentrification in Montreal. Um, and what we're doing is that we are training people to like shoot video, edit video, like record sound, and they're making the video diaries and that becomes an oral history. We are working with the South Asia Women's Community Center with a storytelling program and producing a podcast on like um, queer representation and South Asian diaspora. We work, we recently had an event with Vox on like an artist talk. Um, we are working on the status of all campaign with other organizations as well. So ours are the agenda of this lab is thinking of research and more practice based forms and to like collaborate with communities across Montreal. Um, so this is what like, I hope it kind of gives some sense of the breadth and scope of the research in our department. And I'm happy to take questions regarding research, regarding how to support your work um, after our panel. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ishita. Uh, I just realized that you guys are all smarter than me. It's, uh, it's really horrible now. I, I have a big sense of inferiority now sitting here with you. Um, so um, as I was saying, the program expanded in, in terms of uh, what we're covering, what is our um, object of studies in terms of media, but we also expanded massively geographically. As you can see, the program used to be in the 70s when it started, mostly North American uh, film and media. And now, particularly with uh, Ishita and other colleagues, we have become a more uh, global and transnational, as Claire was saying. Uh, program. We're interested in seeing how movie images uh, behave around the world and are uh, received by different people. Um, so at this point, uh, if you have any questions, you in the room or anybody at home, Anna, um, how do you want to handle this? Uh, you're the boss. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there is already a question in the chat here for uh, Jake. Um, but folks on Zoom, I'm, I'm reminding you that you're more than welcome to jump in just the way I have now. Hello, by, um, <laughs> uh, by turning on your camera and speaking directly to the panel. You're more than welcome to do that. If you want to stay behind the scenes, pop them in the chat and I'll read them out for everybody in the space. Um, so Jake, I don't know if you want to handle the question from uh, Nikki. Do you look at it as modern propaganda? I guess while you were speaking, this popped into the chat. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, in a lot of cases, um, you know, I get, yeah, in, in my work, yeah, a lot of what these companies are doing is maybe not explicitly propaganda, but, but you know, the, the way that they're trying to set up our interaction with the digital world is, you know, aligned with their interests, right? Their, their political economic interests. So, you know, in that sense, um, yeah, I would align it with a kind of 
propagandistic uh, ideology, but um, you know, then that brings up, I don't know exactly the, what you're asking, but there are also obviously the kind of disinformation and misinformation ways that these platforms get used. Um, that is also part of that story and also part of um, what they do or don't do to address that. So um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. These days, propaganda seems almost cute. No, I mean, sometimes we wish for propaganda, right? Because at this point, it's like body modification, um, uh, daily life modification. So it's it's actually becoming way more complicated than the simple idea of propaganda, right? Do you have any questions, uh, real people in the audience? Um, you can ask uh, questions about uh, the program. What we said, yeah. If you can introduce yourself. Uh, all right. <laughs> Sorry, if was, if this was loud. Uh, I had a question for everyone, if you wanted to answer. Uh, what would you recommend to do before entering the program? So, uh, what would you? What would you recommend mm -hmm. uh, that someone does before entering the program? Right. You mean uh, in terms of the DMA, the PhD? Exactly. Both. You mean to enter? Yeah, both. both. So uh, I can tell you a little about a mission, maybe. I, should I go ahead? And so <clears throat> the the obviously you know a, a background in film and media is is useful, but we do accept students that come from other disciplines. Um, I think the institutional minimum is a B, uh, three G GPA, but uh, sometimes, and you know, that's that's usually the case. We rarely accept the students that have uh, um, a, an undergraduate uh, curriculum with uh, degrees lower than that. We have made exceptions based on very specific cases, people with complex his histories and if that happens, it has to be explained in your letter of application. Um, what we're looking for is somebody who comes in motivated with a project, with some idea of what to do, uh, and with strong soft skills. So ability to think, to write, uh, to speak in public, as you have seen from these uh, young people here. Um, so we're looking uh, forward to people who are interested in coming in and pursue a an intellectual project that's that's what we're really looking forward to so we read very carefully the letter of applications the the writing samples we want to see people who are maybe are able to put in written form um uh complex thoughts so that's the, the, the for the for the ma for the phd is more complicated because as i said we receive a lot of application but we only admit five six students um and there it's way more complicated and something called the fit comes in that is to say, um, the availability of uh, colleagues to supervise that project, the competence of colleagues to supervise that project. For example, if you apply to, to us and there is nobody in our department that is even remotely similar to what you're proposing, we would simply say no, because we wouldn't be able to provide you with the support, the intellectual support that you would need. Um, I'm trying to give an example of something we don't do. We do everything now, but uh, I'm trying to think of some. Hmm? Yeah, but so you know, it happens that we had good candidates that uh, that we didn't accept for that uh, for that reason. Do I answer your question? Okay. Yeah. I would just add, like from the student's perspective, uh, like if you can try to identify a prof in the department and just shoot them an email and explain like what you're interested in, like, um, you know, if, if you'd want to work with them, like just just kind of that kind of introductory thing, because that's something that helped me was reaching out to Mark, um, and having that kind of connection, um, I think helped me, you know, get in the door a little bit, and we were able to discuss a little bit like working together. And so that was a nice like thing to have. So you know, go through the faculty page, see see what they're into and shoot an email, the worst thing they can do is say no, but Thanks. Uh, Connor, I see you have your hand up. Uh, go ahead, please. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I had a question specifically about uh, international students. Um, you know, I'm, I'm American and I've applied to a few schools in Canada. And something I've heard is that uh, they, th it seems like there's, you know, there's a set number of like international acceptances that, that some of these places do every year. And I was wondering if, if that's a you 
run things here if there's like say you know, two international students accepted every year or you know it's or they're just thrown into the same the same sort of pool with all the other applicants yeah that's that's a good question so no there isn't any limits of course uh, um, the the problem is funding so i know for example university of toronto has a limited number of international funding we don't uh, we don't differentiate between uh, international and local uh, uh, students. Uh, so the problem is that, of course, as an international student, uh, your fees are higher. So uh, if you're coming in as a PhD, uh, for example, and this is one of the reasons why we only admit five students is because we want to give them a tuition remission fee. The tuition remission fee for international students allow them to pay Quebec tuition, which are substantially, and I mean substantially, lower. Um, so, uh, uh, and on top of a funding package. So um, there is no, and I don't think any school in Canada has a limit on international students. I do know that some school have limits on funding international student. I know Toronto for sure. I am not sure about the others. Do, did I respond to your question? No, yes, that, that is helpful. And, and yeah, I was speaking, I don't know if I said, but yeah, I'm a PhD applicant. I was wondering about PhDs. If, if there's anything, yeah, if there's anyone applying for masters here that has questions, I don't know. But thank you, thank you, that is helpful. You're welcome. Good afternoon, I just wanted to know, um, is it possible to do two PhD programs simultaneously? And the reason why I say that is because we're living in the world where uh, we are dealing with um, linear thinking and organic thinking. So based on the curriculum, you have this more of this linear, whereas more literature based reading, writing and so forth. And then you also have the other part of the individual that's also design, organic, 3D. <laughs> so my question is, for example, in the, um, in the I think it's the intermediate or uh, inter, uh, yeah, independent, independent studies, is it possible to do, um, so for example, if one student in the design department is actually doing a physical, tangible, a 3D project that encompasses the literary aspects, for example, let's say on the subject of mental health after going through COVID and is it, are you able to make that exception? And I say that after hearing you say, if you, you may not have the people mm -hmm. to support that individual, is it something that you're thinking of in terms of health, in terms yeah, of yeah. design and so I forth? Understand. Very good question. So let me get to that. Um, one of the things we one of the many ways in which the program has changed over the years is that we have more and more of what is known as critical um, art critical art practices uh, for example a lot of us now teach uh, videographic essays film essays and we allow students to write on top of traditional papers exams and all the other stuff that you're familiar we allow students to produce video essays or videographic essays sometimes they're called meaning we allow to uh, usually in group or individually uh, to produce uh, moving image film like short films that are as essays so rather than writing an essay about something you make a short film right? and this has become a common practice thanks particularly to the labs and I know that uh, Josh's lab the, the jam labs has, has actually runs uh, um, <clears throat> seminars on this so in that sense we have expanded also what we do in our program in terms of uh, moving away from the written word as the only way to engage with the cultural products. I don't think you can do two PhDs at the same time. I think that's actually at, at least, uh, I mean, I guess you can lie, but I don't think you can. Um, you, what you can do is do a joint PhD um and that's something that the school of graduate studies handles so it's called sgs school of graduate studies they are uh up here on the eighth floor i think and this is something that you have to talk to them about and there are ways in which two phds can be conducted jointly i know indy in sometimes does that it's a little tricky because you have to find two supervisors and basically you have to create your own stream um, I don't advise it. 
I've never seen anybody doing that actually finishing uh, because it becomes just too complicated. Uh, we, as you said, we are two sides of one being, but we're also one being at the end, and meaning you can only be in one place at one time, so it becomes just too too difficult. Uh, but you're welcome to explore it. This is a question for the School of Graduate Studies, yeah. Um, so it's not possible to do two PhDs at the same studies. That's not possible. What you can do is a joint PhD. You, Sure, two PhDs, you enroll in one PhD, and then the next day you enroll in another PhD, right? The joint PhD is one program with, uh, but in which you take classes and you follow the protocols of both programs. So they run parallel. It's called joint. Um, um, I, is, I'm not an expert of this because this is run by the School of Graduate Studies, so I really cannot. Uh, Arwen, do you want? Thank you for the question. I'm the manager for graduate strategic enrollment at the School of Graduate Studies. So I'm, I'm just sharing a few links with Anna in the chat, but we're actually having an information session this Wednesday online. So if you'd like to speak to Lorena Marzatelli, she works with me in the School of Graduate Studies and would be happy to answer your questions about individualized programs, but also the ins and outs of PhD admissions as well. The, am I right? You cannot do two, two PhDs, right? We don't recommend yeah, it, exactly. and I'm pretty sure that it's not allowed in most cases. It's just not advisable for a lot of reasons, but that said, if you're looking at expertise at multiple universities, something called a co-tutel might be possible. Co-tutel joint, it's a yeah. same thing, so, co-tutel joint program. Yeah. Lorena is an excellent resource for this, and she's giving a, an info session this Wednesday at noon, and we have a whole series of virtual information sessions, including program-specific sessions coming up. So the link is in the chat here, and if anyone who's here in person comes see me and I can give you that information as well. Thanks, Luca. Can I add something to it? I mean, like just coming from Luca and like you're talking about linear thinking, but also like practice based stuff. And we do do that, do do that in a program and through our labs. But ultimately, for our students, the result has to be a written thesis. You know, it's also the realities of the job market that if you want to have a job in academia, you need to have a tangible thesis. That's the only way you're going to get a job, not through an artistic practice. That's where the interdisciplinary program comes in. We have students who are translating their research into practice, and that's their final output. We get applications for that. So like Sanaz, she is having this, like uh, one of our interdisciplinary students, she works on petrocultures and media in Iran. Um, and it, her work is through our artistic practice, and her film is now being screened at Berlinale this February. You know, I got an application this year, and I have a, this is a student who works on TikTok, and like she's thinking about TikTok and its politics via some kind of artistic output. And her committee is not made up of just somebody from film studies, but also somebody from anthropology and somebody from art history. So you're getting that different perspective. It's not linear. The, it's not only through coursework and through like written like material it's coming through artistic practice or translating into that so if you're interested i do think an interdisciplinary phd there are some not only here but across the world that have that encourage a practice based output so perhaps that can be something to think about thank you i see another hand up here in the zoom uh, parth if you want to go ahead Hello? I see you're unmuted, but we're not hearing you. You're, oh, mute again. We're playing the mute, unmute game here. Parth, if you're having issues, you're more than welcome to pop your idea in the chat. And uh, yeah, you'll try in a little while. Thank you. I don't know if I'm allowed a question because I was late. So maybe you've already covered it. I apologize. Um, regarding it seems like there are opportunities for research assistantships in the labs and then in terms of teaching assistant with at the master's level if i enroll for masters what do those opportunities look like in relationship to the bachelor is there a bachelor of film studies or classes where you can kind of have that connection to gain teaching experience or yeah what's the what's that looking yeah. like we have a bachelor's program, a master's program, and a PhD program. And you are doing a DA ship. He's in the MA program and he's doing a DA ship. So we, our MA students have DA ships, our PhD students have DA ships so that they get like, not only do they get funding, but they also get teaching experience. Uh, right, I mean, whenever I've taught and I've only got like MA 
years so maybe it's like and it's always been great um so it's a good experience and yes we have Irish ships as well um and that we offer through our labs but not only through the labs like Canada has a grant based model and when our colleagues get grants and they get a research grant, the kind of one of the main motivation of the research grant is to support our students through our research grants. So it's through our ship. So if suppose Luca gets like a research grant, which he has, and then he can he's be like, okay, I want the student, how do I support my student? He puts them on an RA ship. And the rates are not arbitrary, both the TA ship and the RA ships are set, across, set on union rules and the union decides that if it's this many hours, that's the minimum payment. And so like when we have somebody on contract, um, we specify the number of hours and according to the number of hours, the rate is set. Um, so that's how we also kind of support our students besides the package that we offer them. If there are any questions online or live. Um, Nikki just popped the thought in the chat here again. I realize MA students are TAs, but I was wondering, are there opportunities to teach a class while you are obtaining your PhD? Yes, the answer is yes. So this is how it works. Um, as soon as you arrive as an MA student, uh, you can apply to uh, TA for any of the classes. We, we, we put a list out of the classes available. and. Uh, all our MAs receive at least one during their two years, but most often two, if not three, TA ships, uh, in which they accompany a professor throughout the journey of the class. And so their job is to, depending on what's going on, it can be just grading or maybe participating in actively teaching a class, depend on uh, what is the relationship uh, between the professor and the TA and what the TA wants to do ultimately, how much engagement uh, in the class. All our PhD teach a class uh, in their third and fourth year, if I'm correct. So um, students teach at least two classes. Um, and uh, what we try to do, the first class is always one of the class already established, meaning um, the classes that are already in the curriculum, like film history, for example. Um, but we also invite advanced students to to prom, promote, uh, uh, propose their own class. Have you, Jake? Okay, why don't you tell us what you're teaching? Yeah, no. Uh, so last year I did that. I taught film history, um, which was great. A nice, like, you know, you have something to build off. You have a lot of material already there. So that was a good experience. And then this year I proposed my own course, uh, which is called Film and Labor. So it's looking at different uh, representations of work and labor in cinema from all around the world. Um, you know, how do you make work look cinematic? Uh, what are the aesthetics that go into it? Um, what does work behind the camera look like? All these kind of questions. Um, and so, yeah, it's been a really, I'm teaching that right now. It's been really good. It's kind of been nice to go from, you know, the experience of the class that they give you and then you kind of you, you're able to do your own thing with it still um, when you get that but then for this one it's like kind of all on you so it's more responsibility but it's also like been really rewarding to you know make your own syllabus make your own ideas of how to run the class like your own assignment structure all that kind of stuff so that's what i'm doing now and it's been great nikki i hope that answers your question but i see you have your hand raised so go ahead yeah if it's okay i just wanted to follow up question um so are there a certain amount of um, journals or scholar scholarly assignments that you would need to be published to um, continue your PhD at Concordia? Are there, um, I'm missing the word for some reason, but are there um, a minimum of, of uh, published that you have, the amount of uh, assignments you have to get published in order to continue with your PhD? So the answer is no and yes, I guess. So there is no institutionally, there is no requirement to publish uh, before you defend your dissertation, right? That's when the PhD ends. Um, nowadays, when I when I published my PhD, I hadn't published any article before. But nowadays, a lot of graduate students are publishing way before um, they finish their program. So um, I don't know if Jack, you you you're so. <laughs> Claire just published a book, 
So uh, that sort of, uh, <laughs> maybe you can tell us about it. And Jake has been publishing articles as well, right? So yeah, the, the game has changed radically uh, from uh, the 20th century when I had my PhD. Um, so there's way more competition out there, uh, but there's also a different culture um, when it comes to publishing. And so students tend to publish uh, more and before uh, the end of their program. Why don't you tell us briefly your book and Jake your article so that uh, they know what you're talking Okay, sure. So um, I'm aware of the fact that my experience is relatively unique because I basically came into the PhD with the offer of um, turning my master's thesis into a book. So I'd already kind of signed the contract and decided to come to Canada, but then I knew that, you know, I had this deadline within, I think, 12 months, a couple of extensions, um, but I spent my first year sort of, you know, dedicating weekends to editing my master's thesis and extending developing it um, and I submitted my manuscript in December and it's supposed to come out later this year. Um, it's, it's called Representations of Palestine in Egyptian Cinema, Politics of Invisibility, so play with the word of visibility and invisibility. Um, and yeah, that was a lot of work. I mean, I have to be honest that from a, it was like a really difficult first year for me because I was trying to do coursework here, but also I felt like I was still half had one foot in my past working on my master's thesis. But of course, it also really allowed me to get some insights into how the publishing business works and, you know, talking to editors and going through multiple revision cycles. Um, and yeah, and I think in the longer term, it's, I'm gonna be happy that I did that, but it's definitely a lot of work and yeah, it can distract you, but in my case, I mean, I'm hoping to build on some of that research. So it was, you know, a valuable experience. My publisher is Peter Lang Publishing. Oh, okay. Yeah, so a European yeah, yeah, publisher, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I'll just, so I've had a couple things published. The, the most recent one was in a journal called Television and New Media. But so I was going to say what's good about it, though, is, um, you know, that started out as the first chapter of my dissertation. So, it, you know, it's kind of built into the process that, you know, even stuff you write for classes, like final big final papers, you can submit those to journals, see how that goes. Um, and then part of the um, processes once you get uh, your first chapter done it's kind of expected that you try to get it published at a journal um, and it worked out for me so it's kind of like you know part of what you're doing throughout the PhD process is having these um, milestones where you do kind of um, try to get things published and it's you know it's part of the process so yeah yeah you guys are pragmatists very good very good yeah yeah <laughs> If I can jump in, uh, Luca and Ishita, maybe you have some um, ideas here and the students as well to some of the questions that are coming into the chat. We've put some resources in there for you, but there's two kind of similar questions uh, specific to career goals outside of academia. Have there been any grads that go on to pursue industry or other jobs? Tao is asking. Uh, Claudia, who's uh, coming to us from the US of A, also has a question about job opportunities outside of the university um how ways that people can get funding not just through research work but for living purposes as international students so we've put some resources concordia specific in the chat for you but if if you all want to speak to industry uh, opportunities i leave it to you yeah so our ma students uh more or less statistically uh end up working in the culture industry um in the most different job i just received a letter from somebody who just was hired at netflix so we have a branch of netflix here and it does content for netflix so if you see something you don't like in the description of a film on netflix you can blame uh, us um so a lot of our students end up working in generally speaking cultural industries so uh streaming services festivals uh, a lot of people end up working in production in different formats uh, in pr in content producing because what we teach them is in terms of soft skill we teach them how to think and how to write and these are skills that are very useful in an image-based world right um you need an interface between somebody who is unable to do it and somebody who is able to do it right so our students learn that because the, the our ma is two years as opposed to some programs that are just one year they have to take a first year of classes and then they can decide whether they want to write their 
MA thesis or they want to continue taking classes. It's a choice that they make in accordance with working with us, with their advisor. Um, it doesn't matter to us. It's the same, depends really much on the student. Uh, some like to be at home and write a short book like uh, Claire did. Others like to continue taking classes, expanding their knowledge. Um, if you look at our curriculum with each classes that go from uh, early silent cinema to TikTok, literally, and in terms of temporal dimension and geographically with each classes that go from India to Indiana um, and everything and everything in between. You're not from Indiana, Jake. <laughs> somebody from Indiana. Well, I used to make that joke with somebody from Indiana, but it doesn't work anymore. Uh, in terms of PhD, most of our PhD end up in academia. Last year, six of our students got tenure track jobs, uh, which was impressive considering how tight the market is. So we're very proud. And the reason why I think our students, our PhD students get jobs is because they receive a very wide um, um, training. The people who hire our students know that these students can teach, once again, from silent cinema to TikTok. And so uh, because or at this point our reputation is going around and they know that our students are well prepared. And also uh, because of Montreal, because we are such a film cities, um, they come with a, let's call it cultural capital that uh, getting a degree from other places it might not have. So spending time in Montreal gives you a certain cachet, a certain uh, luster, if you like. So I think this is one of the reasons why this is working. Um, Anna, other questions or something I didn't say? Yeah, um, well, I'll just say there are about 10 minutes left. And so for folks in the space, uh, we can still probably take uh, one or two questions from you. You're welcome to stick around and mingle with these people uh, who are i'm offering i'm not actually yes, sure if you're absolutely. all available but okay yeah, yeah. wonderful but i do see uh ruben who has a hand up in the zoom if you'd like to go ahead we'll take that question yeah thank you um i wanted to ask about the connection between the courses and the final project in the master's degree meaning um are students encouraged to work with like their final project throughout the program classes or is it more like a, a separate project and then you work separately on your research and well then for students i also wanted to ask uh if you could share us a bit of your journey if it's okay with you with your research and how the classes helped you with it i can answer that question yeah. um, of course like in the case of uh through my perspective uh we have all the necessary resources to help structure our uh, proposals to pitch to uh, to the committee at the end of this year uh, which in my case, Ishita is really helping me to really structure my proposal, make it really strong. And uh, with Luca as well. well this, is, this is called methods, right? It's exactly. It's called yeah. methods. Yeah, it runs for the whole year. Yes, exactly. So we have two classes called methods. So in the first one, we're really exploring um, uh, the different methodologies in uh, in research in terms of how to uh, structure our research. And then afterwards, uh, the second class of methods, it's really to structure a really strong proposal for our research. And so Ishita really helps us to really like uh, explore the different facets of how to probably structure it and have a really strong thesis to present afterwards for our research to have a good idea of where we're going with it. And um, in my case, in terms of my idea, um, it's kind of like um, it comes out with what you like, basically, like what is your passion in terms of cinema? And uh, in my case, it would be Greek cinema. And also, I wanted to talk about LGBTQ representation, which uh, which is more prevalent today as well. But like in terms of Greek cinema, it's really not talked about. So if there are issues and there are themes that you wanted to address that are not necessarily being talked about and that is kind of like my position in terms of my research in this case. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. And also like, since I'm fresh into the job, so I also remember what it was to do a PhD and the coursework. Uh, I think it's, we have this perception that we have this fixed research project. And it's also like, the courses are not according to our research project. You know, every semester there'll be a course and the faculty with the expertise are offering you a course. It's also good to have a research project, but be open-minded in the directions it can take. And the great thing about learning through courses that might not directly speak to your research interests is that you might come across something that clicks. 
you're like, oh, this is really interesting. Maybe this really works. I had not thought about it. You never know. So it's always good to like expand that breadth. And that is what classes and coursework do. It kind of like expands the our reading scope, our research scope, our methodological scope. And I think that's what we are trying to do in our department. If there's such a broad range of expertise that I think, and ultimately it'll also make your project richer. So like, for instance, he works on Greek cinema and LGBTQ representation. We don't have much about this in this semester for it. And so he'd how would like, it's not directly speaking to the work that he's doing, but there are multiple classes that are on like historiography, on methods, on like global cultures, which might speak to the kind of work that he's doing, and it might give him some ideas and directions to take his research forward. So I think it's something that's really helpful as we are also going along this journey. What if you want to also be, be if you want to be a PhD student, it's helpful to know scholarship beyond your expertise because you might be teaching one day, you might be supervising students one day, and you need to have that broad range, broad range of expertise to help them. So I think that it's it's good to have that kind of open minded approach to courses and not be like it should just directly speak to my research interests because you never know what might just click. Yeah, I also forgot to say that a, a bunch of our MA students end up teaching. Um, those who are here in Quebec often teach at the CEGEP, which is the local college system, college system that precedes university in the Quebec system. Um, and with an MA in film studies, you have access to teaching uh, both in the Francophone and the English CEGEP system. Are there any other hands up in the space here as a as a final question or if not, then maybe we'll invite the panelists to say any final remarks uh, to the audience here. Yeah, absolutely. Do you do you want to do you have something you want to add any of you. No. Yeah, okay. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Second question. Uh, have some of your students in the past also had creative pursuits and um, on the side that's a little bit less academic? Yeah. Has there been some merging of that or whether it's screenwriting or film production? How does that look like? Yeah, yeah so uh, almost all our MA students are creative people and therefore they have some sort of side project going on. It can be baking, uh, chocolate making, uh, uh, filmmaking, screenwriting, poetry, absolutely. <laughs> But often now, what I was telling you before, we have introduced what in the States they call a critical uh, art practices here in Canada, sometimes are known as research creation. That is to say, we are incorporating more and more different way of addressing uh, our object of study. So if in the past you would, at the end of the class, write a 20 page or a 15 page uh, paper on a film or whatever, nowadays, uh, for example, we invite students to use videographic essays. So all of us, I know Ishita and I do it, but a lot of our colleagues have a film making project or video making project in the classroom. Um, so because we figure out that most of our students are fully um, visually literate, way more literate, for example, than I am. So when I first assigned it, I thought that somebody would not be able to edit. Turns out that all my students can edit better than some of some editors. So um, um, visual literacy is now so pervasive among young people that this kind of stuff, in fact, the video essays are sometimes way more interesting, way more exciting, for example, than the traditional essays. So we are trying to incorporate new methodologies. We are still an academic program, so we still have that kind of uh, word first, I guess, uh, uh, writing first model, but we incorporate that m more and more in, in, in our program. Ishita. Yeah, and just to add to it, I, my background is film production, and I transitioned from film production to film studies. Um, and so for me, even though the final output is the written thesis, to have like videographic projects is interesting because I think our students need to know the materiality of the object itself. If you're working with film and you're working with video and you're just like, now this happened and this happened, you don't really understand what the medium is doing. And so the video essay becomes a great way or that Claire has done different things for my classes as well to kind of like, you know, go through this. Uh, and now I've lost my change of thought. <laughs> During my undergrad as well, I've done a couple of video essays in a couple of my classes. 
uh, in terms of assignments and creative liberty, there's so much flexibility. So you have like lots of opportunities to express yourself and um, working, uh, working full time as a video editor as well. Um, I do sometimes do some video essays on my side, but um, I give more attention to my studies, of course, because I really want to focus on that and really focus on my research. But it doesn't stop me from really like pursuing like my uh, a professional career in uh, the, the art field of cinema. I, I forgot to say that as a grad student in fine arts, you have access to the CDA Center yes. for Digital Center for Digital Arts. Center for Digital Arts. You can look it up online, as, and you are you are allowed to borrow material uh, from there. I think it's free, or it's it is free for students. Yes, so you can borrow um, as much equipment as you want for a specific time period. It could be either film cameras uh equipment light uh sound equipment could be you can even um um loan some uh editing uh, yeah. softwares as yeah. well and uh, some editing booths as well for you to work on some projects so there's a lot of possibilities for you to really express your creativity yeah. and uh concordia really helps the students to achieve those uh those goals. Yeah, so the, the, the CDA has been the, the, the a great place for us because we were concerned that some student might not have access to certain equipment, but now with the CDA, it's all there, it's all available, you go online, you book it, and you can work there or you can, quote unquote, take it home. I know many students are also borrowing software from them. Yeah, I think this is what you were... You need a mic. You need a mic. They also have state of the art editing suites, sound recording suites. And if you go there and have your booking slots, they are really helpful. So if you're making editing a project, you'll always have help on hand to like, hey, I've like I'm stuck here. I need some creative like kind of. So it's always good to have that help because you know, sometimes you're so much in your head, you need some like extra feedback on your project. So it's a really good resource within the university yeah, as well. Fifth floor of EV, is yeah. that right? Fifth, fifth floor of EV, CDA, Center for Digital Arts, yeah. All righty, on that note, I'm very mindful of everyone's time. The folks on Zoom are already clapping and thanking you all for this wonderful session and super informative. Uh, for those of you in the space, I'll remind you once again that you're more than welcome to hang out in here, have a warm beverage, get yourself caffeinated and sugar fied is that a, is that a word uh, there are cookies um we we appreciate you taking the time to come into force space here today online or in person we're going to close up the virtual space now but for those of you here stick around and enjoy yeah. thanks everybody yeah. feel free to write to us at our addresses we're all on the website so i'm the only luca in Con at concordia so easy to find feel free to write to me and ask questions thank you thank you anna